because I've met way too many people that that like just knew something would be good, but they couldn't articulate with their words why it would be good. They couldn't explain exactly what customer would have to buy that product. They couldn't tell me how much they thought the product would cost to make, how much they would have to sell it, how big the market would. They couldn't do the basics. Yeah. They just had this feeling that's not enough. Oftentimes people say, man, my biggest fear is public speaking. Well, I got one more for you. The next one is being a comedian. So with here with me today at Clever Talks 2018 is Donnie O'Malley, former Devil Dog, but now founder, owner of Vet TV, man. Man, oh. we finally found some time, baby. Finally, I'm sorry, uh, I apologize. Oh, it's all good. Amazing story you share on stage. But by the way, what nationality do you think Donnie is? I'm gonna give you a moment. I'm gonna give you a moment. <laughs> all right, what are you, Donnie? Uh, fucking American. Yes, it is. Fuck me. <laughs> Come on. But I have Irish. Ethnic background. Irish. Uh, my father's side is uh, very Irish. Yeah. Straight from Ireland. And my mother is a Colombian immigrant. Let, let's talk about your transition from the military uh, real quick. So what was your first step into life after the Marine Corps? The first thing I did, uh, oddly, was I hopped on an airplane the day after I retired uh, medically. And I was never hit by enemy fires. So I don't want that misperception, just weak, kept breaking till the doctor's like, you gotta move MOS's. And I was like, nope. I joined me in the infantry and they're like, can't do that. So <laughs> I was like, peace. I got on an airplane to Africa. Really? And I went and uh, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I, scu I went scuba diving in Zanzibar, day and night for five days. And then I went back to Arusha and uh, volunteered in a couple orphanages wow. for another month. Yeah. Gotcha. And that was my first welcome to the civilian world. You took a vacation. Yeah, in the third <laughs> world. Real smart. Did the money go far? I went to a shithole for my exit from the from uh, six grand a month. From the Marine Corps. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get involved in comedy? Was it something that you're already doing in, while on active duty? Or something you just stumbled on afterwards? I have been doing comedy my whole life. Because I have been entertaining a group of my friends <laughs> with a funny, usually self-deprecating story uh, since I was like 17. So you were that Marine in, in the platoon? Yes. I got it. I was the officer though. So I, I was it. not that Marine in the platoon, gotcha. but I was that officer amongst the other platoon commanders. Got it. I was very fortunate. I had a great group of lieutenants that I worked with and I'm, I'm just so grateful. They're just a highly intelligent, highly motivated, badass group of men. Mm -hmm. Every one of us, I think, came into the Marine Corps with egos too big for the door. Yeah. But then we met each other and, you know, the experience of being an infantry platoon commander uh, humbled all of us and brought us closer. Just an incredible group of men. Very awesome. fortunate. Everyone talks shit on lieutenants. I was very, very lucky. And all of the enlisted in our battalion agreed. They were like, yeah, there was a badass group we had. Very good. Um, what, what unit were you attached to? I was 2-5. Two, 2-5. Two two Second oh. battalion, 5th Marines. I was Echo Company first and then Fox. So I guess going back to answer your question, I was that officer who would have a couple of my other platoon commander buddies together in a circle telling a funny story and making them laugh made me feel good. And that's what I have been doing with my friends since I was 17. Well, even younger, but really 17 was when I really started to blossom. Right. I was very shy and insecure prior to then. So then I'm blossoming. I've, I just loved that feeling of making others laugh. Mm -hmm. And at the end of my time in the Marine Corps, I started writing a book. It started with a blog and then it turned into a book. I published that not long after, mm -hmm. and it did very well. Mm -hmm. I self-published, no marketing. Uh, word of mouth, online. Word of mouth was my biggest thing. I came into it right, and the, 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 the principles that I learned about entertainment before writing that book, I learned it from a couple places. One of them was actually uh, Tim Ferriss and Tucker Max. The Tucker Max, was a, he used to be a shitty human being. But he had very good advice, and the advice was to write as if you're writing to a group of your friends. I wrote as if I was writing to my Marines. And when I started writing shows for television, uh -huh. I wrote as if I was writing to my Marines. And go. that's the way I've always written. And as a company, we choose a group of people that we're gonna write to, and we write to them. That's why we're successful. So what, did Tim Ferriss, what was Tim Ferriss's angle? Uh, Tim Ferriss said he wrote Tucker Max's advice. That's what he did. He actually, Tim Ferriss, went to South by Southwest, met Tucker Max at his booth, mm -hmm. promoting his book and teaching a class on self-publishing, mm -hmm. learned the tenets from Tucker Max. 
Tim Ferriss went and took that advice from Tucker Max and wrote the four hour work week. Well, he wrote the four hour work week as if he was writing emails to his buddies. <laughs> and then we That's all know it. what happened to Tim Ferriss. Boom. Back to back to back New York Times basically. Yeah. Let's talk about a joke. You know, oftentimes I think there's a lot of super members that are just kind of winded up and just it's just really tight. Yes. We're, talk, we're just talking briefly before we went on camera about Jocko. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jocko. Shout out to you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Jocko, so, yeah. you are one scary individual, sir. So, <laughs> so how, how do you... Oh, come on. What's up, baby? Look, at look, who, look who walked in. Of course, he's got to be wearing a tank top, right? <laughs> Coming up. Ah, ah. Kiss him, baby. I want to be a recon ranger. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> I'm scared of infantrymen that was shamed to try and out. <laughs> Love you. Good to see you, Rudy. Love you, brother. And hey, make sure you guys check out his interview in Living Money Smart series. We will talk soon, Rudy sir. Reyes. We're going to uh, make a show with Rudy as a martial arts action fucking hero. Really? Yeah. I was literally, I had an epitome. <laughs> On set, after working with another actress, yeah. I posted a picture, all her fans commented, like fucking hundreds of comments. And it's a weak picture, it's just us. Yeah. And I saw all the power yeah. of, these, of, of her fans seeing us work together. And then I was listening to music and I was high as fuck, right? This is my nightly wind down. After I work, you know, fucking sure. 16 hours. Uh -huh. I have to earn, earn my high. There you go. Smoke my weed and then I wind myself down. And I just kind of think, I decompress. And I like to think to myself, I don't like music, nothing. Just, Your just thoughts. my thoughts. It's the healthiest thing I've ever done in my life. And I um, saw something on my phone, picked it up. Then I open Instagram, I see Rudy Reyes' picture, and I start laughing. I said, some of his pictures are so fucking funny. I start going through his shit, I'm like, oh my god, he's a martial arts action hero. And then all of a sudden I got this vision of him basically remaking Bloodsport or Kickboxer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with his personality. That's it. He's like a beefed up Luke Kang. Or no, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Okay. He's the new Van Damme. He's the new Van Damme. There and I sent him a message, and I was like, Rudy, I just had a vision. Yeah. Listen to my vision. <laughs> and he played it. Whoa, no, he fucking asshole didn't play it for a week. Finally, a week later, he was like, let's talk. Yeah. And we're gonna make this happen. Love it. We're gonna make that vision a reality because that is who he is. Yeah. He is a hero. And he's looking for a platform to express, to express it. 100%. Yeah. And it's like all of the things that he does on a daily basis that communicate yeah. that he is this beautiful and brilliant mm -hmm. and eccentric martial artist. Mm -hmm. I have a team of talented writers mm -hmm. and we're able to study him and his personality study the stories that we want to tell around his personality, create the setting, which I think Thailand is the right call, but we'll yep. see. It's all subject to change. And we're gonna focus our ability to tell stories and create characters around his personality. And it's gonna be a fucking hit. Yep. And once we make that, it'll be financially beneficial for both of us, but then he takes that, and now it's proof to Hollywood that Rudy can fucking lead a film as a martial arts action hero. For the rest of his life, he will have filmmakers coming to him wanting to make films. That's it. Because we, we wrote to his personality, which is fucking dickheads in Hollywood. They they haven't seen it's like the Blade. true value. It's like Blade with uh, with um, Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes. Yep. That'd be his persona. You Blade, something like that. Uh, way, way, way more better, eccentric yeah. than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Blade was a little too dull. Yeah, yeah. For my taste. Gotcha. Yeah. I, see where, I see you're going with that. What? Just watch. But back, so back to the uh, back to the veterans that got a permanent war face on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. How do He's we talking about veterans with... You know, veterans are really wound up tight. And then Rudy runs over, hey! <laughs> and I give him a kiss. <laughs> Some of us are not uptight, but right. uh, many, too many are. I personally th believe that it is unhealthy for them to live that way. And I, I, who knows what they were like before the military, but the military requires you to put on a front. Mm -hmm. And especially if you, you go into combat arms. You go into combat arms, and you're, you have this expectation that you're this badass warrior. Many of them are but not all of them have the, the, the need to put on that front. So some put it on more than others, mm -hmm. especially when you're deploying multiple times to combat. You're in charge of, of teams and squads and platoons. You gotta be hard. You know, everything about your existence is being fucking hard. Because yeah. you're constantly training, the training isn't hard enough. We gotta make this tougher, we gotta PT harder. When you're getting pain, no one gives a fuck. No one gives a fuck about your feelings. It's yeah. just going hard. That is 100% necessary when you are in and you're a professional warrior. When you get out, you do not need to be that way. Diff different story, you gotta shift gears. Shift, your mind. it's a mindset shift. I worry that there are too many people who get out of, of, of that environment, mm -hmm. of being a hard motherfucker, and they're still trying to be hard. They're still trying to be savage. 
you know, and all they're ever looking at is these memes of like, you know, being savage and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, <laughs> fuck you, offensive. And they're going to college and they're like proud of scaring all these college kids. And it's like, bro, get over it, yeah. man. It's okay to have feelings and emotions. Right? You are no longer training to go slay bodies. It doesn't uh, demasculize. No, not at all. You. Not at all. Take away. It's actually harder to actually allow yourself to be emotional. Yep. And it's healthier. Because all these guys who keep trying to be hard, how many fucking wives do they end up going through? How many women do they date or marry yep. who leave them because they're like, I can't communicate with you. Yep. You can't communicate with me. It's over. And it's, and it's, yep. it's done. Yep. And of course you have a nice bunch of shows in your network that shows a lot about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, how does one then start using humor in their life? You, we were talking about your process of telling a joke. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. so how, does, how, do, how do you do that? Okay, so this is just, Here we I, go. I don't want to, to make this seem like this is every, everything. No, not, not every comedian. Yep. This, this is just me personally. My brand of humor is to speak intelligently and intellectually, articulate well the way I was, was raised by my mother and father, very educated people. Even though my dad was a Marine grunt, he became a Navy doctor. They all they did was beat education into us. I enjoy taking this very officer-like, intelligent and articulate persona and walking someone into a joke. Whereas I could be telling a story like I was yesterday about a conversation with an employee who I I I made feel like I, I patronized him. And all week he was and how, kinda angry at you. How he felt about that. He told me. And at the end of the conversation, it, everything was great. I apologized, said, I'm very sorry. I didn't mean to, commun to, to, to make you feel that way. If I did, that was a mistake. That was a miscom on my part, bro, my bad. And then he says, you know what, man, it's all good. You know, I was probably having a bad day anyways. We're cool, man. And I said, okay, great. Well, you wanna go fuck me in my ass in the bathroom real quick? And <laughs> that right there is my, typically, my brand of humor. I like to walk you into a, a situation where you expect it's going one way, and then out of the blue, I say something very inappropriate, yeah. dark, perverted, violent, irreverent, and that has worked for me personally. So did he say yes? Oh, oh of course. <laughs> he, I would have fired his ass if he said that. <laughs> Come on. See, what a lot of people don't understand is that Marines would say this, but it really doesn't happen. I mean, it doesn't really happen. I mean, we yeah. just, or did it? No. <laughs> I forgot, you got a lot of civilians in your audience. Yeah, yeah, right, right. understand yeah, yeah, yeah. the humor. See, veterans, we get this, you know? Yeah. So, last couple thoughts here. Tell me a little bit about Vet TV. And you, you know, you, you built it, you used some fantastic numbers. It's a network that did a million, I think, was you said your first year, a million dollars in revenue? Of subscriptions alone. Excuse, I'm sorry, subscriptions, yes. Alone, yeah. We started with a great idea. Mm -hmm. We basically, we did the same thing MTV did in the 80s. The guys who created MTV, they were bored and they wanted, they were working for like American Express, which they were, they had a lot of money and time. They're like, you know what? No one is making television for the teenage demographic. Back in the 70s, everything on television was cartoons or it was cops and lawyers and dramas for like, you know, the adults, 25 and up. Yep. No one was making anything. It didn't exist for teenagers. So they were like, let's make something to serve the teenage demographic. Somehow it became music only in the beginning, whatever, but that was the logic. So I thought, no one is making things for the veteran community. Hollywood is making entertainment about the military experience, but not for, for veterans. Interesting. Because it's a market that is not, there's not enough money in that market for them. Because the way Hollywood produces is insanely expensive. I mean, there is a lot of lack of efficiency, but it's also, they work with unions. The, the, their cost is 10 times ours for everything because we just fucking, we, we pinch pennies. Yep. We can, we're very flexible with what we can do. It's just not financially viable for them, but it is for us because we're able to make good quality film at a, at a lower price. Let's make stuff for this market mm -hmm. that they really want to see that they cannot get anywhere else. And that was the logic. I, initially, I didn't tell a soul. I conceptualized all this in my head. I went trademarked everything first and then I made a blog post and said, this is my idea for veteran television. And sure enough, you know, the secret, you put it out into the world, right. into the universe. Right. Well, I put it out there on my blog, which didn't get that many hits back then. It still doesn't, because I don't fuck, I don't ever, ever, ever use it. it. Happens in two years. Um, there are maybe 50 hits a day back then. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm getting phone calls and emails from people who are pitching me shows, like I'm some studio exec. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa bro, this right. is just an idea. And where was your first office again? And my first office, my grandmother's sunroom. 
grandma's sunroom. I you know, I, and the, the reason why I told that yeah. in my speech yesterday was because I, I wanted to reinforce that you don't need tons of money at first. Right. You don't need all this special camera equipment, and yeah. extra shit. You just need a good product that people can't get anywhere else. And if you can't find a way to separate your product from someone else selling something similar, then pick a new fucking product. And so it was just it was a good idea at first. We put it out to the world. People came to us, hey, I would like to work with you to help this dude. A couple of them were my Marines, a couple of my old machine gunners. We're like, hey, sir, let's fucking do this. And I was like, bro, don't call me sir, but let's do this. Do you know how to build an email list? No? Well, fucking learn because that's your job. Do you know, can you build a spreadsheet with all the Facebook groups that relate to the military? Uh, sure, okay, then that's your job. Nice. All right, and I'm just tasking shit out. I don't know what I'm doing. I was like, you do this, you do this, you do this. And I, 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 I said, you will be paid a portion of the money raised if we, if we succeed. And that was it. So everyone's working for 6.5% or something like that. Yeah. Because I didn't have yeah. any money to give them at first. Yep. I mean, I guess I could have, but. You talk about bootstrap. Bootstrap, yeah. Zero dollars. Because what, what was your, your grandma's sunroom? What was the double purpose of it? Well, I was taking care of my grandmother. Got it. Uh, that was why I moved wow. in there. I had my surgery when I came back from Afghanistan. She was taking care of me. She got sick. And then I started taking care of her. I moved in with her. I was living there. She still charged me rent. Fucking cheap ass. This immigrant mentality. Like nothing's for free. That's correct. She That's didn't correct. take a. F she's so proud. She didn't take a, a never a hand out in her life. She's and worked she her give out a hand fucking out. ass. Oh nope, nope. Yeah. She worked her ass off, and she's very proud of that. And so her grandson's living in the thing, and she's like, yeah, okay, it's gonna be two hundred bucks a month. And I'm like, yeah. two hundred bucks a month. Grandma's a lot of money. I was making six thousand dollars a month at the time as a ring captain. And I'm like, $200, I'm trying to like negotiate her down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so I was, able, I was able to take care of grandma. Mm -hmm. I, wanted to, I wanted to provide her with a good experience at the end of her life, not be alone. Because let's be real, all of our grandmas are one slip away from dying. Yeah. One fall. And then... Yeah, mine have already passed away. Live there. Yeah. Yeah. So fragile. And then also, that's where the business started. So what do you think is more important at this stage, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship? Intellectual or your gut? One over the other. Intellectual. Intellectual. Yeah. And, and here's why, because I've met way too many people that, that like just knew something would be good, but they couldn't articulate with their words why it would be good. They couldn't explain exactly what customer would have to buy that product. They couldn't tell me how much they thought the product would cost to make how much they would have to sell it, how big the market was. They couldn't do the basics. Yeah. They just had this feeling right. that's not enough. Gotcha. You need a, a baseline understanding of, of the, the market yep. of, and, and, and why. Like th That's one thing. Numbers are important. How big is the demographic? How much of the demographic can you capture? How much is it cost to make? How much is each item going to sell for? That you, you think, and this is all hypothetical in the beginning, yep. right? So you need that. But the other thing is, why are they gonna buy your product? You, can't you, gotta, you gotta flush that through. Yeah, if you cannot explain why they're gonna buy your cup of coffee instead of this cup of coffee, and this one, and this one, this one, if you can't give a really solid reason why, then it's not good enough. Yeah. Then you need to develop, you need to improve the product to improve the why, or choose a new product. So that would be your advice to somebody in transition and they're thinking about entrepreneurship as an alternative to a typical job, is to actually do the numbers, do the analysis, make sure that it works, and will they make money? Yes, you have to approach it practically and logically. It's not enough to have an idea, and it's not enough to know this is gonna be great, right? That's a great starting point. There are plenty of people who, who, who didn't start with that. They just started with like seeing, oh, huh. A lot of people seem interested in that. Let's give it a shot. How can I monetize that? And then that's what you run through. Uh, right? You see, you see the demand first. Yeah. And you're like, how can I fill that demand? Okay. Uh, how can I make that financially viable? Okay. Wow. And then that, putting all of that together, develops the feeling in the gut. Once you've done that, then it's the appropriate time to go with the gut. Mm -hmm. Because what, what exactly does the gut mean? It's, it's just this feeling. Mm -hmm. But where does the feeling come from? You have to articulate. And ideally, the feeling should come from, and this is, I love giving this advice about dating and women too. It's the same, the same thing. It's like, I just love her, I just love her. Why? Why? Outside of the obvious. Yes. That, em that emotion is yeah. not enough. Yeah. 
She needs to make you laugh. She needs to intellectually stimulate you, make you better, yep. get along great with your friend, you know, all these things. Yep. You have to articulate them and be specific about all these things. And then it's like, yeah, that's the one. That's the girl. That's the product I gotta sell. Yep. The gut should needs to be, be built uh, from a foundation of logic. Danny, for the best comment below, they get your best feedback, your best nugget from him. Drop in the comment section below, and I'm gonna autograph this poster. I'm gonna send it to you. So, Danny, thanks so much. Thank you for, for having being me. here. Really appreciate it, man. On this uh, Veteran Entrepreneur Series, guys. If you want to be plugged into a community that wants to know more, be more, and have more, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click subscription right here and hit notifications to be uploaded, to be alerted when you upload the next episode. If you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and like our business page. That being said, on behalf of Donnie O'Malley, Matt Zapal, you money smart guy, and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.